Okay, well, it's three o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's um, oh, Livestock Guardian Dog webinar for November. Um, my name is Bill Costanzo. I'm the Livestock Guardian Dog Research Specialist here at the AgriLife Center in San Angelo. And I would like to thank a few people. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board for providing funding for the program here and for uh, helping us put on today's webinar. Also, Dr. Reed Redden, he's our um, interim director of the center. And uh, as always, Robert Pritz for his expertise with the uh, oh, Zoom meeting. So thank you guys for all that. Um, our sponsors today are uh, Lone Star Tracking. Um, so if you have any tracking needs, please uh, contact Thomas from Mert at uh, Lone Star Tracking and they can help you guys get taken care of. Uh, if you guys have questions throughout today's presentation, we will answer all those at the end of the program. Um, if you need anything else, just feel free to uh, message us in the chat box there and uh, we can try to help you out. Um, oh, I would like to thank our speaker today, um, Dr. Mary Ansala. Uh, she's a lecturer in the Department of Veterinary Pathology uh, at Oklahoma State University and currently serves as a project leader for the National Center for Veterinary Parasitology. In January 2019, she completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship um, and she focused on ticks their geographic distri distribution and tick-borne diseases at Oklahoma State University. Uh, she's originally from East Tennessee. Uh, she earned her bachelor's in animal science uh, from the University of Tennessee in 2000, or excuse me, uh, 2011, and a PhD in veterinary parasitology from Virginia Tech in 2017. Dr. Sala enjoys uh, teaching students and currently serves as a laboratory instructor for the veterinary parasitology course. Uh, she's also an active member of the American Association for Veterinary Parasitologists. And in her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her fiance, Chris, and their two dogs, Blue and Bella. And she likes exploring nat uh, natural parks and bird watching while she always keeps an eye out for ticks. So uh, thank you again for uh, all presenting for us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Doctor. Thank you, Bill. Hey. I really appreciate it. Can everyone hear me okay? And if you are, if you don't mind muting yourself so we don't get some feedback. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Robert was on top of it. So I think I'm unmuted now. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Sala, Barium Sala, as Bill introduced me. And uh, I love ticks. I'm a veterinary parasitologist. I love everything about ticks and other parasites. Uh, but what's most important for health of our animals and people is controlling our parasites. So today I'm going to talk to you about the ins and outs of tick control, particularly for uh, dogs. So let me share my screen so you can all see the slides. All right. Can everyone see? All right. I think we're good. So this is going to be the ins and outs of flea and tick control. And we're gonna start with fleas and move on to ticks. So why are we concerned with preventing fleas on dogs? Well, one thing is fleas are an ectoparasite and they feed on blood. So there's some direct disease. We see anemia in dogs that are flea infested. There can be flea allergy dermatitis and fleas also transmit a variety of diseases, anything from tapeworm to flea-borne rickettsiosis and really severe disease such as tularemia and the plague. So uh, flea prevention is important on dogs, even our outdoor working dogs. In fact, it's probably more important for our outdoor working dogs because they contact with wildlife more than an indoor pet would. Now, one thing about fleas is that by the time you see fleas on your dog, you see those adult fleas feeding and jumping around on your dog, that means in the environment where your dog lives, there's already immature stages. There's flea eggs, there's flea pupa, flea larvae that are already cycling in the environment and that's gonna be a source of new infestations. So if you see adult fleas on your dog, that means your environment's already full of flea eggs and more fleas are gonna come from that environment. So if all you do is do a product that can kill the adult fleas, that doesn't help with that biomass that's accumulated and can then be a source of infection going forward. So thinking about flea control, it's more than just killing the adult fleas. So where do our fleas come from? They come from wildlife, they come from other dogs and cats, and they come from those environmental stages. So we have the, um, the flea pupa, which is an intermediate stage in the life cycle. And these are resistant to almost all treatments, even if you apply 
an environmental um, insecticide, the pupa are gonna be resistant because they're in this little cocoon. So to control fleas, we wanna apply effective insecticides to our pets. We also wanna do some environmental treatment and cleaning, but we have that resistant stage that we need to somehow penetrate and break through so we can break the life cycle. So those accumulated immature stages in the environment won't come back and be adults. So to keep those from coming back, we target the immature stages with products that are called insect growth regulators or insect development inhibitors. And you'll see that throughout the pre uh, presentation, just abbreviated IGRs or IDIs. So that's what we're gonna use on the pets. So to prevent fleas, we wanna use a persistent insecticide that kills adults, but also target those immature stages. And if you have a flea problem, you have fleas in the environment. So to break through that cycle, you have to treat every pet, every dog, every month, all year long. If there's a break in that control, then the life cycle is gonna break through and you're gonna still have a flea problem. For environmental management, this is a little bit different than what I would normally um, talk to a, an indoor pet owner about. Frequent cleaning and vacuuming is the hallmark of flea control for indoor pets. But with livestock guard, guardian dogs, they're gonna be outdoors or in a kennel or other outdoor shelter. So you're not gonna vacuum your outdoor shelter, but what you can do is apply some insecticides if you know that there's flea issues in your kennel or yard and making sure every single dog is treated because an untreated dog is gonna be a source of blood meals and that's gonna help the adult continue the life cycle and keep laying eggs. Also trying to discourage or control access from stray dogs or other wandering dogs onto your property because they're gonna bring the fleas with them. So we know we wanna get rid of fleas. We know we want to treat fleas. I've told you that um, most successful flea control, you're killing the adults, but you're also targeting those immature stages that are in the environment. So how do we do that? And what are some of the products we're gonna look for? So um, the first thing about different flea control products, there's a lot of options out there. I'm sure you all have seen, um, there's shelves and shelves at PetSmart or Petco or Tractor Supply. There's an unlimited number of flea and tick control products out there. So how do you pick uh, the very best ones? So you have to think about your lifestyle as a dog owner, the lifestyle of the dog, what's gonna meet your needs. So there's topical products that you would just apply to the back. So those are spot on, stripe ons. Sometimes they're a dip, sometimes it's a spray. Collars are considered topical products. There's also shampoos, mousses, powder, lots of different ways. There's also transdermal products, which are products that you apply topically. So it might be a spot on or a stripe on, but then those products are absorbed systemically and they get into the bloodstream of the animal and um, don't just lay on the back of the dog. They actually penetrate the skin. There's also oral products or injectable products. Again, those are gonna be systemic in the, in the animal. And then there's environmental products that you can use to help control those immature stages. And frequency of application depends on which product you're using. So if you're using something that's not very residual in the environment or residual on the animal, you might have to reapply every two to three days. It might be weekly. For most of our topical and especially our transdermal products, you have monthly reapplication and they're effective for a full month, but there are longer lasting products that can last up to six months. So we're gonna talk through some of these different flea and tick control products. Um, and you'll see how there's just a variety of formulations. So these are just some examples of flea control products that you can use on the pet or in the pet uh, depending on if it's an oral or transdermal product. And what I have listed here, so fipronil, neonicotinoids, spinosad, selamectin, isoxazolines, these are the generic drug name. This is the actual drug that's doing the killing of the fleas. And there are lots of different products that contain fipronil. There are lots of different products that contain spinosad. But what I have in the PowerPoint slide and in the notes I provided to Bill that you all should be able to get a copy of um, tables listing the product. So this is the ingredient in the product. 
and then what it does. And then you can match that up with the different products that are commercially available that you see on the shelf, you know, the Frontline Plus or Revolution or Comfortis. And it is not possible to cover every single flea and tick product for dogs. Even if I had three hours, I could not cover every, every single product that exists in the US, but I will show you examples and talk about the very best ones and the best group of drugs or ingredients to use. And that's what you should look for in your flea and tick control products. So there's also um, flea control products that you can use in the environment in addition to on your pet. So those are organophosphates or the pyrethrins and pyrethroids. And the first ones I wanna talk about are the pyrethrins and pyrethroids. So pyrethrins are a mixture of compounds that were originally derived from plants. So um, they're really similar to this original botanical extract. They are very short acting and have to be reapplied frequently. These are the atoms or the sergeant sprays that you find. You can even find them in the grocery store like at Walmart or HEB. Um, they're very safe and effective for kittens and puppies, but they're not as potent or persistent. So with a product like this, you're gonna have to reapply it over and over again. I believe for a lot of livestock guardian dogs, it's not very practical to handle them over and over and over again. And if you're bringing them up all the time to give them a flea or tick bath, then they're not out with the animals like you would intend. So the next generation of these projects are the pyrethroids, which are synthetic compounds. And because they're synthetic, they persist much longer on the animal. And I do have some red text here. Um, products that are labeled for dogs should not be used for cats because there are some serious safety toxicity issues. And I know this webinar is focused on livestock guardian dogs and flea and tick control for dogs, but uh, lots of times people will sometimes have leftover product and think, oh, I'll just use it for the cat as well. So you wanna be really careful about what product you're using and only use dog products for dogs, only use cat products for cats. So um, that's just something to think about. Yes, you can get these sprays in the grocery store and they do work, but they don't last a long time and they're not very potent. And these will kill adult fleas. This is what they'll do. So we wanna do more than just kill the adult fleas though. We wanna kill those eggs that are in the environment. So the adult flea lives on the dog and it's laying eggs as it's feeding. And then the eggs fall off in the environment and you have a larva and then they will pupate. And this is an environmentally resistant stage. So it's really hard to get a drug or a chemical in the environment to penetrate this. So what we really wanna do is use a flea control product um, that contains these adjunctive therapies. So either the insect growth regulators or the insect development inhibitors. And what these compounds do the adult flea ingests them when feeding on the animal, but then it stops the flea egg from hatching or it stops the flea larva from being able to develop to the pupa or it stops the pupa from hatching. So all three of these compounds do something slightly different, but what they have in common is they disrupt the life cycle and they have an effect on these immature stages on the egg, larva, and pupa. So for optimal flea control, we want a combination product that kills the adult fleas, but also the immature stages. I'm gonna go back one second. If all we do is kill the adult fleas, there's the eggs that that flea's already laid in the environment that will become larva, pupae, and then adult fleas that can then bite our animal again. So that's why we wanna do something that kills the adult fleas and also immature stages. Quite often when people feel that their flea control isn't working, or maybe there's resistance to the product, what's going on is they're using a flea control product that's an adult aside only. It only kills adult fleas, and it does nothing to address that environmental source of immature fleas that grow up to then feed on the dog. So there's a lot of different products that do the combination of adult aside, so killing adults, and impacting immature stages. And the best way to find out if it's a combination product is to check the label. So we want something that kills adults and is that IDI or IGR, insect development inhibitor or insect growth regulator. And on the next few slides, I've included um, some tables that I know they look boring, but it's really good information and really helpful um, to kind of walk you through this. So 
I am not endorsing any particular product. This is not a complete list of every product available, but these are some really common ones. And I tried to pick a few different ones so I can show you what we're looking for and what'll work best in your guardian dogs. So Canine Advantix 2 is the first one I'm gonna start with. It's very common. I think a lot of people are familiar with this. Um, here I've listed the active ingredients. So permethrin, imidacloprid, and pyroproxifen. And these are what those ingredients are. So it's a pyrethroid and it's an IDI IGR, which these are that immature stage disruptors. And I've listed, does it also kill the immature stage? So everything on this table kills adult fleas, but then I've, does it get immatures as well? And then I've added, when can you first administer it? Because products have different, um, different age of administration. Some you can use in puppies as young as six or seven weeks. Some the puppies have to be six months, and then there's um, sometimes a weight requirement. Uh, I feel like for most livestock guardian dogs, you're going to hit the weight requirement pretty early, so that shouldn't be as big a concern. But especially for really small small breed dogs, um, it's very important to hit that weight. So, uh, Canine Advantix Two or any product that contains these three ingredients will kill adults and will get the immature stage. And then for Canine Advantix 2 specifically, you give it every month and puppies need to be seven weeks old and at least four pounds. For uh, Vectra 3D, we have a very similar um, drug component. It does get both adults and immatures. You would give the product monthly and puppies have to be at least eight weeks old. Now, Soresto, which is a collar, not a topical product, contains flumethrin and imidacloprid you give it every eight months. So you put a collar on, you wait eight months, and then you put a new one on. And puppies have to be eight weeks or older. And for immature stages, I have yes-ish because it does kill the adults and the package insert says it also kills larvae that come into contact with treated dogs. But it's not doing anything um, for larvae that, that don't come into contact or for the larvae being produced from those adults. So that's, you can see there's some wiggle room. Then we have some other uh, flea and tick control collars, specifically looking at the flea control, um, the Scalabar or Activil protector bands, and they don't kill immature stages. They only kill adult fleas and you can use them every six months. So um, they don't last quite as long as Soresto, but they do last longer than a monthly product and you use them in puppies that are 12 weeks or older. So these are some topical products. Um, a few more examples. Advantage 2 is um, another combination product that has that adulticide and gets the immature stages, and you can use it in puppies as young as seven weeks. So what you can do, and you see Fipronil, there's lots of products that contain Fipronil. Fipronil kills adult fleas, but it does not kill immature stages by itself. So what companies have done is there are products that are combination products with another ingredient added and that adds more um, desirable traits to the product. So Frontline Plus or Pet Armor Plus is Fipronil plus Methoprene and that's that immature stage interrupter. So this will kill adults and the immature stages and really help control your flea infestation. So I have more examples on tick products and we go through the specific tick products more closely. If you have any questions about flea control, you could go ahead and type them into the chat box or make a note of them and save them because we're gonna switch gears to ticks. So I just wanted to kind of give everyone a, a heads up about that, that we're gonna switch to ticks. I love ticks. I know they're terrible and disgusting and they transmit awful diseases, but they're also really fascinating really fascinating parasites. So I think we're all familiar with ticks, sadly, and ticks have a pretty negative impact on just about every aspect of uh, animal health and veterinary medicine. So it's really important to control ticks. So the generalized hard tick life cycle is we have an adult living on a host. It could be a dog, it could be a sheep, a goat, a person. The adult feeds and takes a blood meal and then it's gonna drop off the host and lay eggs in the environment. And here's a female with her clutch of eggs. Out of the eggs will hatch larva. The larva only have six legs, whereas the adults have eight legs. 
So the larvae are teeny tiny, sometimes they're called seed ticks and they only have six legs. So they will find a host, take a blood meal and then molt to the nymphal stage, which has eight legs and is smaller than the adult. You can see the size comparison here. And most of the tick's life is spent off the host in the environment questing for another host. Questing is what it's called when a tick is looking for a host. So they are on a host, then they fall off a host, they molt or they lay eggs and they come back to a host. And it's that moving from host to host and from different types of animals that really helps them be such great disease vectors and why controlling ticks is hard because they don't live on the animal the whole time. They come and go. The environment is full of ticks. Um, the livestock guardian dog or any other outdoor dog or outdoor animal is constantly living in the ticks turf on the ticks territory. So tick control is really hard because we're in a constantly contaminated tick environment. The common ticks of dogs in the US are listed here. Lone Star Tick, Amblyoma americanum, very common throughout Texas and the Southern US, but it's creeped up as far as Illinois, Iowa, um, Ohio. It's even been reported in Michigan. So that's uh, this tick distribution map. Amblyoma maculatum is the Gulf Coast and it's all around the Gulf Coast, but also the Atlantic region. The American dog tick is widely distributed across the US. And then in our Rocky Mountain states, we have a really closely related tick, uh, Dermacenter andersoni, or the Rocky Mountain wood tick. We have Haemophysalis longicornis, or the Asian long longhorn tick, or uh, the bush tick. And I've got a red mark next to that because this was recently introduced in 2018, and it was actually first discovered on a sheep in New Jersey. So, and this tick can decimate uh, livestock operations, particularly sheep and cattle because the females reproduce without a male, they're parthenogenic, so they can really blow up populations really quickly. And on the, like the index case where we first recovered it in New Jersey, there were hundreds and hundreds of ticks infesting one animal and all life stages were present. It was a very severe infestation. So we're on the lookout for this tick. It's not been reported from Texas as far as I know, and it's not been reported in Oklahoma yet but it has been reported in Arkansas. So, and then Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick or black-legged tick, which is the vector of Lyme disease, uh, the Lyme disease agent Borrelia. And here's our distribution for the black-legged tick. And then on the West Coast, we have Ixodes pacificus or the Western black-legged tick. And then Ripicephalus sanguineus, our brown dog tick, is found all over the US it thrives indoors and is found basically anywhere there are dogs. So that's why that's marked. So where are the ticks coming from? How do dogs get ticks? For almost all the species listed, with the exception of Ripicephalus, dogs acquire ticks in the environment. That's where they pick up ticks. So for your house dog who doesn't leave the house that often except to go to the bathroom, they're not exposed to ticks nearly as much as our livestock guardian dogs or other working dogs. The livestock guardian dogs are constantly exposed. They are living in the tick environment. So it's very easy for them to become tick infested. With Ripicephalus sanguineus, we can have indoor, infestation, indoor infestations. So kennels or outdoor dog runs or even partial, partial shelters can become infested um, quite readily. And um, it's important to, to take note of that. So even if you don't have an outdoor kennel, an outdoor, even if it's an outdoor kennel, it's still a kennel where the dog is spending a lot of time and there's some shelter, nook and crannies, you can get a brown dog tick infestation very easily. So a, a little similar, I'm trying to make a case for why you should consider tick control, why it's very important. As with fleas, ticks are blood feeders, so we get blood loss. There's also wounds and tick bite damage just from the tick attaching to the animal especially with amblyoma and exodes. So that's our lone star tick and our deer tick. And then we have tick paralysis is a major concern for American dog tick and the Rocky Mountain wood tick. And there's a lot of disease agents that ticks can transmit. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is just an example of what we can see in North America. And cytozoonosis is a cat disease. I'm so sorry that I left that on. Um, 
but the other diseases listed here, um, dogs are all susceptible to and do show clinical signs. And I know not everyone listening is in Texas necessarily, but in the Southern US, so including Texas and Oklahoma and even Tennessee, the rate of ehrlichiosis in dogs is twice the national average. So in the South, we have a major ehrlichia problem and that's from those brown dog ticks. And there's also more brown dog ticks in the South. So um, it's very important to think regionally about where you are and what, what tick disease problems you have, but everywhere in the US has tick problems. So we all need to be using tick control. So how do we prevent ticks on dogs? If the dogs are outside living where the ticks live, we need to use persistent acaricides. So those are the drugs that kill the ticks. Every dog, year round routine treatment. And then if you only treat one dog, then that leaves untreated dogs for ticks to feed on and continue the life cycle. Same thing if you have any barn cats or outdoor cats, if they're untreated, they're a source of free blood meal with no, no penalty, no drug, nothing that's gonna negatively impact that tick population. And if possible, doing routine tick checks will help. And managing the environment is complicated because the livestock guardian dogs, your dogs are living in areas where the ticks live. Um, if you can discourage or control wildlife access, um, that is helpful. And that's what your dogs are doing part of the time. Um, what would be more helpful is keeping stray dogs who are not up to date or not having tick infestations controlled, keep them from coming onto your property or into your kennels or outdoor facilities or outdoor shelters because their ticks will lay eggs and drop off and set up infestations in your, in your outdoor enclosures. And spraying uh, tick, tick control acaricides, so that broadcast acaricides would be spraying a whole yard for ticks. And that's not very effective or practical. It's really expensive and it doesn't work very well. It doesn't persist in the environment. It gets washed away really easily. Um, being exposed to the sun, the drug, the chemicals are gonna be inactivated. And ticks don't just live in that pasture all the time. They are moving in and out, ticks quest. So they're hunting, they're moving, trying to find a host. They might be on wildlife, on coyotes or deer coming through the yard. So the tick doesn't stay in that yard. So uh, spraying some sort of tick preventive on your yard will not work. Now, in the case of a brown dog tick infestation in a kennel, then yes, you do need to you know, have an exterminator come and spray properly, but just an outdoor area, spraying the whole yard or pasture is not helpful. So there's a lot of different characteristics to consider for tick control products. We want an effective product. So there's the labeled efficacy. So that's what the package insert, what it says that drug is supposed to do versus what the veterinarian or the client or owner sees happening. And then there's also some of these products are decades old and um, fleas and ticks can become resistant or tolerant to certain drugs. So that has to be evaluated. There's some safety concerns using high concentration pyrethroids in cats or on small puppies. Amitraz has some toxicity issues if it's um, a high dose. And then ease of administration, I think this one's gonna be very important for you all. Is it an oral medication that you can add in with the food or is it a, a product like a collar where you have to handle the animal or is it a topical product where you have to handle the animal every single month? I think some of you have livestock guardian dogs that you could do that. You can handle them readily and give them medication every month or put a, a spray or a spot on product. But some of you probably have dogs that you don't handle that often and this would be really difficult. And it would be great to have a product that both repels the ticks, so keeps them from biting the animal so that it can't transmit any diseases and also something that kills ticks. We want to stop and prevent disease transmission. And some folks have questions about a systemic or oral product or any product where the tick has to bite the animal to ingest blood to be killed. Because any biting or taking in of blood is a risk of disease transmission. So folks, some folks repel, prefer repellents because the tick doesn't have to bite to get the drug. 
but no product is 100% effective. And in the face of overwhelming tick burden, um, you will see exactly how, how big the tick burden can be. This is a video from the woods uh, near campus here in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This is a natural area. We were out looking for ticks and all of these moving brown spots are ticks. We just were stomping around the leaf litter looking for ticks and this is what we found. So a tick control product is, let's say for example, is 95% effective on the label. And they have to be at least 90% effective to get a label claim, depending on the drug and if it's EPA licensed or FDA licensed. But for this example, let's say 95% effective. And your dog walks through this and there's hundreds of ticks, but we'll say there's just a hundred. So to be 95% effective, that means it has to repel or kill 95 of the 100 ticks that are there. So your product does that, but five ticks still get through. So that's five ticks that can still transmit a disease, still take a blood meal and still lay eggs and carry on the life cycle and reinfest that environment and keep ticks in your area. So you have to bear in mind that the products are really, really good, but they're not 100% effective, which is why it's to get the best or most complete or comprehensive control, um, it's important to think about different types of products. So maybe you want a repellent that will repel the ticks, 95% of them, but then you also want a product that's gonna kill the ticks in case they get through the repellent and bite, then they'll still be killed. And there are products that contain both ingredients, both a repellent and something to kill the adults. And we'll talk about those. Um, Okay, so I mentioned this for um, fleas and it applies for ticks. The most important thing is that your tick control is routine and year round. A lot of folks talk about a tick season and there are seasons when ticks are worse than other times of the year, but ticks can persist year round. It needs to be above 35 degrees for a tick to, um, for an Exodes tick to be active. So, there's definitely days in the heart of winter in Texas or in Oklahoma where it's over 35 degrees and ticks are still a concern. So um, routine and year round is very important. How you give the product, that's gonna be a decision for you and how you manage your animals. The treatment interval. So some products are monthly, some products you can give every three months and some products are reapplied every six months or every eight months. So we will, we'll go through that. And then some of the newer products are really fantastic and they actually interfere with disease transmission and prevent the pathogen from being transmitted from the tick to the dog. So I have highlighted or mentioned where that's the case. Um, if that's something that's important to you as a livestock guardian dog owner, you might wanna consider that. Also, this does not apply to folks in Texas or Oklahoma. But if you're in an area with Lyme disease transmission, so that's gonna be the Northeastern US or the Great Lakes region, Midwest. Um, so if you're in a Lyme endemic area, you also wanna vaccinate your dogs against Borrelia burgdorferi, and that's an annual vaccine. And Lyme disease is um, gonna impact the quality of life for your dog, but also they're just not gonna work as well if they get Lyme nephritis, where their kidneys fail, you don't want a guardian dog in kidney failure. You don't want severe arthritis or lameness where they're not um, keeping up with the herd like they're supposed to. They're not patrolling the fence line or um, running off any predators or other wildlife. You all have invested a lot of money and effort, I'm sure innumerable amounts of time and effort into these dogs. They are an investment and they serve a really important purpose. So you wanna keep them safe and fit so they don't succumb to disease, particularly when it's disease that we can prevent. So the control products, so we want those effective products. So our insecticides for fleas or acaricides for ticks. So again, here I have listed the different drug classes and each drug class contains specific drugs. And these are related within a class so there's gonna be a lot of the same effects. So for the macrocyclic lactones, milbamycin, oxime, and selamectin 
are very similar. They're in the same drug class, so they act the same way. For the isoxazolines, all of these different drugs that end in laner, they are in the same class, so they share a lot of similar traits. So for the tick control products, the isoxazolines are the newest class of drugs that have come about in the last five years, maybe five or six years now, uh, time flies. And they are really fantastic products. Most of them are oral products that kill ticks very quickly and are highly effective, no reports of resistance yet. Uh, pyrethroids are also very effective at killing ticks. Um, they are available in topicals and in collars. And I will, I have some great examples of those. Uh, Fipronil and macrocyclic lactones are historically what we were using with the py and with the pyrethroids for tick control. There's some reports of resistance to certain ticks to Fipronil or tolerance to certain ticks with Fipronil. And then the macrocyclic lactones, you'll see they don't, they're not labeled to kill as many different tick species as the isoxazolines. So let's look at these. Again, I have the tables, but then we'll go through some products one by one. So this table is all the brand new class of drugs, the isoxazolines. And there's a lot of different brands and you can see the different ticks that they kill. So depending on where you are, if you live in Louisiana and you have a lot of Gulf Coast tick and that's really important to you, you might want to consider using one of the Seralaner products that kills Amblyomma maculatum. Notice that the other ones don't. But depending on which formulation you use, um, you might not be able to use it until the dog is six months or older. So that's for Semperica. But Semperica Trio, you can start using in puppies eight weeks or older. The uh, Brevecto and Credilio, it's really important to give these with food because the bioavailability of the drug is different and it's more effective when given with food. So if, if you have a great product, but you're not giving it properly or the drug isn't being absorbed at the optimal dose, then it's not gonna work as well. So it's important to pay attention to the administration notes. So this is just a nice comparison summary of the isoxazolines when you administer them. So all of them are monthly with the exception of Brevecto. So Brevecto you give every 12 weeks. So that's every three months. If you're concerned about Amblyomma americanum, that's the Lone Star Tick, you give it every eight weeks. So every two months. So while this might be a higher price point to buy Brevecto compared to NexGuard or Credilio or Semperica, you're getting two months for the price for that price or three months for that price, depending on which ticks you're concerned with. So I know it is very expensive or can be very expensive, especially when you have multiple animals. So that's one thing to realize is that the products might be, not all of them are monthly products. So don't compare a monthly product to a three month product because that's, um, that's, uh, that's your money going three months versus one month. So here's NextGuard, a Foxalaner, again, this is for eight weeks, puppies eight weeks or older, weighing at least four pounds. This kills the listed ticks. It also kills adult fleas and prevents transmission of Ehrlichia canis, which is transmitted by the brown dog tick, that's that Ehrlichiosis, and uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the agent of Lyme disease. And these are in experimental trials where they've shown that this trans uh, blocks transmission of diseases. And then Brevecto, which is the 12 week administration or every eight weeks for Lone Star Tick. Dogs have to be at least six months old and over 4.4 pounds. And this is one where you have to give it with food and it does prevent transmission of Ehrlichia canis in, in those experimental studies. Then Credilio, um, again, it's part of that isoxazoline group. You would give monthly and it, you can give it to puppies as young as eight weeks. Also effective against adult fleas in addition to the listed tick species. And now Semperica contains Seralaner. You give this monthly, but the dog has to be six months or older. And this kills um, five tick species plus fleas. And also has been shown experimentally to prevent transmission of both Anaplasma phagocytophilum, which causes anaplasmosis, and Borrelia burgdorferi, which is Lyme disease. 
And there's another formulation of Semperica called Semperica Trio. And this one can be given to puppies as young as eight weeks. So they don't have to be as old because it's a slightly lower dose. And it's effective against the same tick species and fleas, but it also has some um, intestinal parasite control as well as, heart, as well as heartworm control. So this is a, a broader spectrum product. It gets ticks, fleas, intestinal worms, and heartworm prevention. Okay, some more topical tick control products for dogs. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just an example of some common products. So these are our topicals that you apply to the skin. So Canine Advanix 2, Vectra 3D, and the bottom three are collars that you would put on the dog. So our monthly spot-ons are, are for puppies in either seven or eight weeks of age, and you have to reapply it every single month. And it does get um, five different tick species. Now for our collars, it's either every eight months or every six months, and you can give, um, some of the collars are safe for puppies eight weeks and up, but like our Scalabor and Activil collars, puppies need to be 12 weeks or older. So it's important to pay attention to this. And with a breed like, I mean, livestock guardian dogs are a ton of different breeds, but let's take a Pyrenees, for example. A Pyrenees puppy is gonna grow really, really fast and get big very fast. So if you put a small dog Soresto collar on your 10 pound Great Pyrenees puppy, very soon he'll be over 18 pounds and need to switch to the large dog collar. So it's important uh, with these large breed dogs to make sure that the puppy product is for the dog of that size. Um, you need to be careful that you check the size that the product is rated for. So this is looking at products more closely. So K9 Advanix 2, the ingredient that is killing our ticks and fleas is permethrin. And it is safe for puppies seven weeks or older. Again, it kills the five different tick species plus fleas. And it also um, works against the flea eggs and flea larvae. So you can see that um, this again is more comprehensive, more broad spectrum. It gets our ticks. It also gets fleas and the immature flea stages, which is important for um, the most optimal flea control. Another example, Vector 3D also contains permethrin. You give it monthly, it gets the adult ticks plus fleas, and it also um, helps with the flea eggs and larvae. So a little more broad spectrum within the ectoparasites. Now, Soresto collars, um, everyone reminds me, and I know this myself, Soresto collars uh, can be expensive. They are expensive, but they last for eight months. And, um, and then you're good to go. So you put it on once and you're good for eight months. It kills four different species of ticks, plus fleas and gets the flea larvae. Experimentally, it's been shown to prevent, prevent transmission of Lyme disease agent, Ehrlichia, and anaplasma. And also um, with the Soresto collar, you only have to handle the animal once every eight months. So that saves you some, some handling time, if that's an important consideration for you. Now, the Activil Protector brand, brand is another collar um, that prevents fleas and ticks. And the product label instructs you to wipe the collar with a damp cloth prior to application. I know that might seem like a silly note, but it's important to take note of those things and do them to ensure that the product will work um, effectively. And you wanna use this every six months so again, this is a product where you won't have to handle the dog as often, just every six months, put the collar on and then replace it. Uh, they do work if the dog gets wet. And then I'm gonna jump back to Soresto. If the dog frequently bathes or gets in water, it can reduce um, effectiveness uh, by about a month. It could decrease it to about six or seven months. If you bathe the dog every single month, it will reduce it to about six months. Um, but if the dog just happens to get wet, not a thorough bathing, um, then it's not as severe. And these collar products take a week or two for the product to distribute on the dog and actually be effective. You can't put the collar on and get immediate um, killing and repelling of the dog. The product has to diffuse across, all over the dog, um, be in the system so that it can kill and repel the fleas and ticks. 
And that's true um, for both of these collars, as well as the Scalabor uh, collar. So, um, so collars are a great option, especially if you don't want to handle the animals as much and they, um, they do persist well um, in the outdoor environment. Now, if you have dogs that play rough and lose their collars over and over and over again, this might not be the best choice for you. You wouldn't want to spend all this money and put a really great collar on your dog only for it to get pulled off and lost in the field somewhere. So you have to, those are only things you'll know about your dog. And then I just want to list a few topical um, tick control products for dogs that are still commonly used um, that have efficacy against fleas, but with the newer products, they're not as they're just not as, they're not the new kid on the block. They're not as great as our new isoxazoline class. So um, Celamectin, the brand is Revolution. You can see it pictured here. It is labeled as a tick control, but it only is labeled to kill Dermacenter variabilis, the American dog tick. So this isn't gonna get all tick species. So this um, wouldn't be your best choice because more than one tick species is a problem. You give it monthly and you can give it to puppies as young as six weeks. The Amitraz Preventic collars um, are great. They get six different tick species. You reapply it every three months. So if you're trying to handle your animal less, this is better than a monthly product, but it's still pretty often. And you can use it in puppies 12 weeks or older. And then we have Frontline. And um, this contains just um, an adulticide that's gonna kill the fleas, kill the ticks, but there has been some reports in the literature of fleas or ticks that are resistant or tolerant to frontline or to fipronil, I should say, to fipronil, to products that contain fipronil. So there's also um, frontline plus or Parastar plus, and those are the same fipronil products, but they have an added um, insect growth regulator, insect development inhibitor, like we talked about, that will be effective for more than just uh, the adult fleas. So that's, it's nice if you can get a product that does multiple things for you. So you get the most bang for your buck, but you have to consider what you need um, for your dogs. So with that, um, thank you guys. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. There is a really great resource that I want to um, point you guys to. It's this CAPC, which is the Companion Animal Parasite Council. Um, they have a great parasite product kind of comparison page. And I'm happy to answer your questions. I wanna answer your questions. And here's my email address. You can reach out to me anytime. But if you're sitting up at 2 a.m. trying to decide what to buy um, online or from your vet, I won't be able to help you even if you email me. So, or if you just want to have this resource available to you more often, let me share my other screen so you can see, or let me just drag it over. So when you click on that link, it takes you to this CAPC quick product reference guide. Um, I think it's going. Let me double check. Yes, okay. So what you can do is filter it by uh, what animal you're interested in. So we want dogs and we want a product that gets, let's say Lone Star Tick, because we're in Oklahoma or I'm in Oklahoma and there's lots of Lone Star Tick. And I also really care about fleas. So scroll down to fleas do I just want adult fleas? No, I also want some immature stages because I know that fleas, adult fleas means there's fleas in the environment. So I select those things and it tells me that Soresto for dogs gets all of these parasites or some paracatrio and it lists what other parasites they get. But I could change it and say, I just want something that gets adult fleas and um, and the larval stage. So this is just a handy little reference if you wanna compare products. I thought that you all might uh, find useful. So with that, um, Bill, thank you so much. I, I will stop sharing and we can do questions. Well, great, thank you, doctor. Um, so, oh, the first question um, oh, that we had up from a little bit earlier is, uh, Oh, somebody says they have a very fluffy um, Great Pyrenees Anatolian Shepherd mix, mm -hmm. and they wanted to know if a spot on will provide complete coverage or not. So with 
dogs, especially Great Pyrenees or any of those dogs with really thick hair coat, um, you, if you just apply it to the top of the hair, no, it's not gonna get good coverage. You're gonna need to part the hair and apply it to the skin. You would probably be better off using a product that is transdermal. So one that you apply topically to the skin, but then it gets absorbed systemically throughout the dog's body not one that just sits on top and is trying to diffuse through the hair on the surface because that will inhibit efficacy. I have also heard from some folks with great peers that Ceresto collars, um, I've heard that it works for some folks and I've heard that it doesn't work as well for some for others. So I don't think there's a, I haven't heard a clear one way or the other, but with dogs with really, really thick coats, it can be hard for that product to diffuse if it's not in contact with the skin because their coats are just so thick. Okay, um, well, I guess I had a question uh, oh, kind of coming up on, regarding our own guardian dogs. So, mm -hmm. um, oh, I've seen some things online and maybe somebody else has this same question just as one I ask, but um, using two products. So for instance, using um, like a Ceresto collar and then also using like a long acting thing like Brevecto at the same time. Are there mm -hmm. any issues with, um, oh, I guess I'm more concerned with like toxicity Safety, for the dog yes. itself versus, yes. you know, necessarily killing all, every flea and tick on them. Yes. So using products in combination is um, a great thing to do, but you have to make sure you're doing it safely. You're exactly right, Bill. So there are some products that you should not stack on top of each other like the Amitraz collar, the Preventic collar, with other similar like organophosphate-based um, products or other products containing Amitraz because you, um, you, know, you could kill your dog and you don't want to do that. But check, um, there are a lot of products that can be used safely in combination, such as the Brevecto or any of the other isoxazolines and the Ceresto collar. It is okay to double up on products, especially when your your whole goal, your what you're really trying to do is really make sure no fleas and ticks are getting through, or as few as possible. So the label will tell you when you buy the product, or even before you buy it, you can look online, or um, the company website, or um, you know Amazon. You you can find the label online, or you can ask your veterinarian um, if you have specific ones in mind. But I know the Isoxazolines plus the Resto is something that a lot of people use in conjunction with no safety issues. So um, the label will tell you if there are specific things to look out for though. And I'm happy to answer questions about specific product combos if you guys have them. Um, but you know, that could just be limitless. So it's impossible to list all the possible combinations, but you can, and if you have a tick problem and because products are only about 95% effective, or even if they're 99% effective, if there's a thousand ticks, you know, that's a hundred that are getting through. So you, it is safe. You just need to check the label. And if you have any questions, consult your veterinarian or reach out to um, an extension agent, or you can contact me, a, a veterinary parasitologist. I feel like most people don't have a veterinary parasitologist they can easily reach out to, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I don't know. Does anybody else have any other questions um, that's out there? Mary, I'm Miss Reed. I got a question yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. um, in the you know, internal parasite world for sheep and goats, um, we kind of frown upon the real long-acting dewormers because mm -hmm. you know that that curve of effectiveness starts going down, mm -hmm. and so we see higher rates of resistance development with those longer-acting products. Is that the same in some of the long-acting? Because I know our livestock guard dog users are going to like the ones that last the longest. Yes. You know, especially the ones that are hard to get their hands on. But yeah. is there a risk that they're taking with those long acting products? It is a risk if you don't replace the collar at eight months or if you're, or six months or three months, whatever the um, projected efficacy timeline is. Or if you're bathing the dog constantly, which I don't think any livestock guardian dog owner is doing. Um, so it's a risk if you leave it on further than intended. Um, that uh, what is it's like a tail effect I know exactly what you're talking about and I can see the graphs in my in my head um, so if you leave it on past when it's effective then you would have a problem so I've seen people that just put a new collar on top of the old collar and 
I don't know. I just think if you handle the dog to get the one collar on, you should pull the other one off. So um, yeah. just making sure you remove the collar and not leaving it on at a suboptimal or lower than effective dose will be important. Um, okay. But that will be interesting to keep an eye on and see the Soresto collar has been out for, I want to say at least seven or eight years and I haven't seen any data, but we're all kind of, you know, just waiting because the drugs kind of follow a pattern. So yeah. it'll be interesting if, if that does come up. So you, you said bathing, but with, I'm, I'm assuming soap or something like that is going to, is going to dissipate yes. these drugs off quicker, which again, yeah, guard dogs are probably not getting bathed that regularly, but yeah. in the summer, they do spend a lot of time in a water trough. I uh, think, as yeah. Big, you know, kind of cooling effect. Mm -hmm. that, in, I mean, hours. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know they would spend hours. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. To my knowledge and the bathing studies I've seen and what I pulled together, it's that detergent or that soap, you know, something that's disrupting the product. Um, because if a dog, if it's raining, it's an outdoor dog and it rains, that's not washing it away as long as it's been absorbed. So I will look into that and I'll email you and Bill and let you know if I do find anything. Um, Cause I don't know that companion animal drug companies think about that. I don't know, you know, I don't know they've done a trial where a dog stood in water for two hours every day to see what it looked like. So I'm not aware of it. What I've read is it's that detergent, it's the soap getting in there and breaking up the, you know, the chemical bonds. But I will check and see if there's a time in just plain water um, effect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great yeah. if you could send that and then we can get that posted out for people too. Yeah. Um, we could even do it like uh, make an infographic if you want, Bill, but that's separate. <laughs> I love infographics. Oh, okay, me too. <laughs> I do them for tick control all the time. So that's why I was thinking about it. Is there a, um, oh, this is a question. And again, I don't know if, you know, anybody else has this question or not, but, um, oh, for immediate tick control. So say, you know, you're going out, you're working your livestock and you're going to take care of your your livestock guardian dog, but they're covered in ticks. And so obviously the, the collars take a little while, the pills mm -hmm. take a while. Um, what's the best, you know, like quick combination of something mm -hmm. to give to, to treat them as soon as you see them yes, and then, yes. you know, the next product to give. So in a case like that, yeah. if it's a dog you can handle, it would be great to give them a bath with a pyrethroid or permethrin containing shampoo and get that, get the dog saturated, get the product on and you will see the ticks start to detach and fall off before your eyes because you're you know, putting that chemical on top of the dog. Um, if it's a dog you can't handle, then I'm gonna double check something in my notes, so please bear with me. But there are some that will start killing the ticks in a few hours, but if it's just a head to toe infested dog, um, you might want to you know, spend the time bathing it, getting it up so that you can actually um, physically remove ticks in addition to that chemical shampoo to help, um, help remove ticks. So bear with me one second. If you have another question while I'm looking, I'm happy to answer, but if not, we'll just pause for a moment. Would a, um, oh, would a dip be any easier oh. like on a livestock guardian dog oh or? a dip would be i would consider that equivalent to a bath as far as effectiveness for starting to get the ticks to detach and drop off um i just don't think of most companion indoor dog animal people having a dip but yes if you have a dip available that's that's totally fine too okay. um so yeah the speed of kill for a couple hours is um fastest in those isoxazoline products. So Brevecto, NexGuard, Simperica, those have, yeah, they start killing um, fleas within two hours and then ticks within eight to 12 hours. So it okay. still isn't instantaneous. The best thing would be a dip or bath with, um, with those products, so yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, if you had a heavily infested dog and you know, you want to get them treated right away. And yeah, something some type of long acting product. Yes, you want to get a permethrin pyrethroid on the skin as fast as possible because it'll actually come into contact with the ticks first and get them to release. Okay. And we well, do see those else dogs. 
have any other questions that's out there still? Well, oh. somebody's going to be doing some shopping at least tonight for oh, some products, so that's good <laughs> at least. You're very welcome. I'm glad to to help, and do feel free to email me or email Bill if you have questions. Um, this is my this is what I love talking about. I love ticks and all things parasites. So, good luck. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up again. Thank you very much, Dr. Sala, for uh, all presenting today. And um, for those that are watching, she will be giving another presentation for us in January. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we'll get that date out on the Facebook event here sometime real soon. Um, again, I would like to thank our, the uh, Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board, um, Dr. Redden, our interim director, and Robert Pritz again for helping out with the Zoom. And uh, our sponsor today, uh, Lone Star Tracking. Again, if you need any GPS trackers for your dogs, uh, they have a variety of those, and Thomas can definitely help you guys out. So if you guys have any other questions, um, oh, feel free to email me or uh, oh, Dr. Sala with her email that was there you guys taken care of. So thank you guys very much. And we'll, we'll meet up with you again in January.